Torrential rains hit northern China, causing floods and landslides. A local river embankment collapsed, leaving behind a 50-foot breach. Video reveals a large number of virus isolation wards in Shanghai, yet officials say no new CCP virus cases were found on Sunday. China's top companies lost $3 trillion in total market value. That's amid Beijing's efforts to tighten control on domestic businesses. Beijing passes one of the world's strictest data control laws, but it's not aimed at protecting users. The result? Companies suffer, including foreign firms doing business in China. And an unprecedented move by the Chinese communist regime. Beijing shuts down a local branch of a U.S. auditing company. That's after it had investigated forced labor in China's Xinjiang region. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Inclement weather in northern China this weekend, causing dark skies and torrential rains in Shenxi province on Saturday. Two counties there suffered flood and landslide damage, with many residents cut off from electricity, water and cell phone signal. In Mian County, part of a local river embankment burst under pressure from the heavy rains, causing a 50-foot breach. One resident explained that much of the local flooding came from that breach, which quickly soaked the area. Some houses collapsed, there's landslides, and trees collapsed. Then the traffic is difficult, with many places are out of water and electricity. Chinese media reported that flooding flowed through farmland into the county's downtown area. Six main roads were severely inundated, with water measuring around two feet deep in the worst hit areas. More than 1,000 cars in the county were also submerged, and at least 60,000 people are out of water and electricity. Elsewhere in Sichuan County, floodwaters released from a local reservoir led to similar destruction. One video shows a section of collapsed road in the county, leaving behind a major road hazard. It's raining heavily. Shichuan's reservoir has discharged large amounts of floodwaters, and the country has been affected. According to Chinese weather reports, more torrential rain is expected to hit the region in the coming days. Central China's Henan province is also getting drenched by a second round of heavy rains. Precautionary measures are in place, and many roads, highways and tunnels are closed. Residents say they are staying away from low-lying areas. NTD's Don Ma has more. Parts of China's Henan province are once again enduring heavy rain. But residents and authorities are carrying out strict precautionary measures this time around. According to Chinese media reports, hourly rainfall on Friday and Saturday reached nearly three inches in parts of the province. Weather authorities in the province also issued a dangerous weather warning to alert locals. On Saturday in Zhengzhou City, rainwater was seen accumulating in the streets. Water levels in nearby rivers also started rising, prompting authorities to impose precautions. All public transportation and online ride-hailing services have been halted in the city. Dozens of bridges, highways and tunnels have been closed, along with local tourist attractions. This time, the infamous Jingguang Tunnel is also closed. That's after massive flooding recently left the two-mile tunnel and a mid-afternoon traffic jam inside submerged. Authorities have set up flood water barricades inside and outside the tunnel. They're also standing guard 24 hours a day at the tunnel's entrances and exits. Last month's flooding has caused unease among many residents. City streets and public areas now remain largely empty. Locals who own cars have parked them on higher ground as a precaution to keep new floodwaters from washing them away. Many cars have been seen parked along highways, while some underground parking garages seem completely empty. In other areas of Henan, several cities have also temporarily closed schools and businesses. According to Chinese media reports, in Zhengzhou City alone, Around 240,000 residents have relocated due to heavy rains. Don Ma, NTD News. The extreme conditions in Henan province have led netizens to question where Chinese Communist Party leaders are as the situation persists. One netizen wrote online, even China's provincial leaders didn't come out for inspections. In other countries, the prime ministers and presidents came out during natural disasters. Top Chinese authorities rarely visit catastrophe-stricken areas. The region's previous round of heavy rains hit the province's capital in July, submerging part of the city's subway system and a miles-long traffic tunnel.
Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping has yet to visit the area. Instead, he traveled to Tibet for an inspection just one day after Henan's major flooding. China's Prime Minister Li Keqiang did visit Henan province last week, but the trip comes nearly a month after the devastating floods. Videos shared by China state-run media outlets appear to show residents surrounding Li and praising Chinese authorities. But other locals seem to be reacting differently. One resident from Sixiang City spoke to NTD, saying he wasn't there and is only there now, only after the danger is over. He's just playing games, fooling people. Others reported receiving little to no aid from authorities post-flood until just last week. One resident from Hui County told us that in her village, locals were given a subsidy worth less than $50 after they were displaced by flood damage. Locals say they received no further help. Beijing is announcing new data on its virus situation. On Monday, the city reported that no CCP virus cases had been found locally on Sunday. We call COVID-19 the Chinese Communist Party virus or CCP virus because CCP's cover-up in the beginning of the pandemic led to the virus spreading around the world. As for the official pandemic figures coming out of China, NTD cannot independently verify the numbers. That's due to the regime's history of underreporting virus cases and its tight control over what information is released. Looking at China's megacity, Shanghai, authorities announced five confirmed CCP virus cases there over the weekend. All of the patients had been working in the cargo department of the Shanghai Pudong Airport. All five had been fully vaccinated with Chinese-made vaccines. Since then, all cargo routes and services have been suspended, though the airport also announced that passenger flights are still operating as normal. Podong Airport is the world's third biggest cargo airport and the biggest in China. Official reports didn't name the source of the outbreak. All airport staff were tested for the infection over the weekend. A video shared by one of China's state-run media outlets captured the scene. It revealed a number of two-story quarantine isolation wards, which had been placed nearby lines of staff waiting to get tested. A netizen also posted a related video on Saturday, showing that authorities appeared to be working overtime to build more. Some netizens questioned whether Shanghai officials had prepared the isolation wards in advance, suggesting that they may have known about the airport's outbreak earlier than they let on. A violent episode in China's latest Delta variant hotspot, Yangzhou City. Volunteer lockdown security guards beat a man unconscious after a clash on Saturday. A police report says the man broke through a lockdown checkpoint on his electric bike. But he was soon stopped. He struck a guard, and that's when the fighting began. A video circulating online shows five guards in red vests grabbing the man by his hands and feet. A guard kicks him in the head and chest as he struggles. Then he passes out. He was reportedly then sent to the hospital. A resident near the scene told the Epoch Times the guards beat the man too hard. He says it looked as if they were trying to kill him. The incident sparked outrage online in China. Some writing, should a guard kick a man in the temple and heart when he is already in control? I believe no one would have to break through a checkpoint if they could get help for their problems. A local lawyer told the Epoch Times in anonymity that many officials and other personnel abuse their power amid the lockdowns, and it's led to resentment among local residents. He says while local residents generally don't understand the legal issues, they do feel their rights and freedoms have been violated, which easily leads to conflict. The incident happened in an area labeled medium risk for the virus's Delta surge in Yangzhou City. So far, the area has been on lockdown for more than 20 days. China's top companies lost about $3 trillion compared with their peak value this year. That's about one and a half times the size of Apple and far exceeds most countries' GDP. Beijing's tightened control is making these companies' market value fall. These enterprises include consumer businesses, pharmaceuticals and internet-related businesses. Among them, video sharing app Kuaishou suffered a decline of over 80 percent. A rice wine company that held first place in China's domestic share market suffered a price drop of over 40 percent this year. And China's leading pharmaceutical company lost half of its market value in this wave of control. And the list goes on. 
The CCP's most recent blow is for the education and training industry. Stock prices for these entities outside the Chinese market immediately plunged. Analysts say that's because investors sense further danger to these companies from the CCP's political suppression. China's clampdown on tech companies continues. Beijing passed one of the world's strictest data control laws on Friday. But one expert says it's not to protect users. NTD's Evelyn Li has more. China just passed a sweeping privacy law that some say is one of the strictest in the world. It reportedly closely resembles the EU's data protection law. It requires permission from users in order to handle their data or provide it to others, among other things. But Arthur Herman, senior fellow at Hudson Institute and director at the Quantum Alliance Initiative, says the law wasn't passed to clear up complaints by Internet users. And I don't think anyone living in China is fooled for a minute that this is about protecting the data of users. Everybody understands that their personal data is, is completely available to the government and to the police and intelligence services in China. The Personal Information Protection Law, or PIPL, was passed Friday. The law will take effect November 1st, and Chinese tech stocks continue to plummet. According to Carmen Lucero, a fellow at the Yale Law School Paul Tsai China Center, nothing in the text suggests limits on government surveillance. Herman says quite the opposite is the case. He says the regime is sending a message that ultimately Beijing is in control and that foreign investors can't influence Chinese companies. He thinks the real reason for the new law is to limit foreign companies' access to Chinese data. Data that they collect and their companies collect from American users like TikTok, they see that data as perfectly uh, available uh, and uh, perfectly permitted for the government, the Chinese government, to use that data as part of its a lar building a strategic picture about America, uh, about our allies. Experts say that it's also part of China's ambition to become a tech superpower. So in the end, this is really another stage in a high-tech war between the U.S. and China. He adds that this could just be the opening shot. He expects Beijing to extend its control over Chinese companies while becoming bolder in gathering data from other countries, especially now that the Chinese regime sees the U.S. sliding away from global commitments in the light of recent events in Afghanistan. Evelyn Lee, NTD News. If a Chinese tech company wants to list in the American stock market, it may have to hand over its data control to a third-party firm. Reuters cited inside sources saying Beijing is considering just that. But the third-party firm that would monitor these companies' data may not be as neutral as it sounds. One source says the communist regime wants state-backed information security firms to do the job. And Beijing believes that would limit these companies' ability to transfer data overseas. U.S. Representative Michael McCall said in a statement, this is one more piece of evidence that private companies do not actually exist in the People's Republic of China. They are all under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. He added any company doing business in China must answer to the Communist Party, which threatens transparency, privacy and national security. About 40 Chinese companies have raised more than $12 billion from entering American stock market so far this year. This, according to the financial markets platform Dialogic. That's nearly double the amount raised over the same time last year. In an unprecedented move, Chinese authorities shut down the local branch of a U.S. labor auditing company. This company had investigated forced labor practices in China's Xinjiang region. The move comes amid China's continuing bid to counter forced labor allegations of ethnic Uyghur minorities. The company, now closed, is called Shenzhen Verite. It was previously hired by major American companies like Apple and Disney and is affiliated with U.S.-based company Veritate Incorporated. Shenzhen Verite released a report earlier this year that found forced labor practices were indeed in cotton production in the Xinjiang region. Chinese state-run media have since rejected the report and its claims. China's actions against Verite are reminiscent of those against Swedish clothing brand H&M earlier this year. Chinese authorities closed down many of the retailer stores after the fashion brand announced it would stop sourcing Xinjiang cotton, citing concerns over forced labor violations.
Verite's former president called the move a huge escalation on China's part. The company's troubles began as early as March. They stemmed from being hired to investigate Xinjiang forced labor allegations by the Better Cotton Initiative, a Europe-based nonprofit. Vice President Kamala Harris touched down in Singapore on Sunday. While in the region, she aims to reinfer the U.S.'s commitment to its Asian allies, following the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Her purpose? To deter China's aggressive behavior in the Indo-Pacific region. Let's take a look. Vice President Kamala Harris's official visit to Southeast Asia begins. This comes amid concerns about the U.S. commitment to the Indo-Pacific region, following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. In a joint news conference on Monday, Singapore's prime minister said the Biden administration inherited a difficult situation. Successive U.S. presidents have declared their resolve to withdraw from Afghanistan. So I told the vice president that we understand President Biden's reasons for his decision. The U.S. intervention has stopped terrorist groups from using Afghanistan as a safe base for 20 years. For this, Singapore is grateful. The Prime Minister also offered assistance to the U.S. evacuation operation in Afghanistan. Harris's trip aims to deepen ties with Asian allies in a joint effort to counter the Chinese regime's continued aggression in the South China Sea. I am standing here in Singapore because of our commitment to a long-standing relationship, which is an enduring relationship with the Indo-Pacific region, with Southeast Asian countries, and in particular, with Singapore. Meanwhile, the Chinese regime's state-run media, Xinhua, has accused the United States of turning Southeast Asia into its frontier against China. Harris later visited Singapore's Changi naval base. Defense officials briefed her on the U.S.-Singapore defense relationship. She will head to Vietnam after departing the country on Tuesday. According to the U.S. Embassy in Singapore, Harris will discuss with both nations issues including regional security, the CCP virus pandemic, and efforts to promote a rules-based international order. The U.S. is condemning China's aggression towards Lithuania after the European nation expanded its diplomatic ties with Taiwan. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with Lithuania's foreign minister in a call on Saturday. He said the U.S. supports Lithuania forging deeper ties with Taiwan. Earlier this month, China demanded Lithuania remove its ambassador from Beijing and withdrew its envoy from Lithuania. That's after Lithuania let Taiwan open a de facto embassy. In a statement on Saturday, the State Department described U.S. support for Lithuania in this conflict as ironclad. And the Taiwanese foreign ministry expressed their gratitude to the U.S., saying its strong support toughens their resolve to fight off authoritarianism. This year, NTD will hold its ninth international classical Chinese dance competition. We sat down with a candidate to understand more about the costs and rewards of living the life of a professional dancer. As a dancer, you're always moving around, and so you're always very fit, I guess. So usually when you eat, you could eat like whatever you want. So it doesn't really matter. You could just, yeah, eat whatever you want. So the most exciting time is like lunchtime? Yeah, when you eat. <laughs> Nineteen year old Michael Hu is from Feitian Academy of the Arts in upstate New York. Outside school, he goes on tour to perform around the world. His journey with classical Chinese dance didn't start out smoothly. I didn't really like it back then. The strict routine of a dancer didn't easily fit this teenage boy. We normally wake up around seven to eight, and then we have our morning routine, which is like stretching, kicking, bar, combo, off bar, and all that stuff. And then we have lunch. Sometimes we have um, academics or more dancing. And then we have dinner. And then at night we have more dancing again. <laughs> and you can self-practice if you want at night. All that stretching paid off when he started learning techniques. like the technique shen dai shou, where the body leads the hands, and kua dai tui, where the hips lead the legs. These skills were once lost, but they're believed to reach the highest realm of artistic refinement. So you first use force from your body right here, then it 
goes all the way into your hands. It's like the girl's water sleeves. Like they uh, do this and then the sleeves go out. He said this technique helps make the movements longer, bigger, and more beautiful on stage. Who was born and raised in the U.S.? He says at first it was hard for him to grasp some of the elements of classical Chinese dance. The teachers are always talking about the inner meaning. But I'm like, where's the inner meaning? But through studying and entering the minds of characters he has to portray on stage, he began to get it. In the dance piece he prepared for this competition, who will play the best known tragic hero in ancient China, Xiang Yu? The cultural icon is portrayed in countless Chinese novels, poems, operas, and dramas. The rebel leader's matchless might and bravery couldn't prevent his eventual defeat and suicide. And his life was said to prove the role of fate and the ancient Chinese belief that higher beings are in control. Even though he was one of the greatest warriors of all time, but heaven just doesn't want him to claim the throne for the emperor. So he accepts that. So he tells his fellow soldiers that it is not that I can't fight, it's that heaven doesn't want me to win. And so knowing this, he makes his last stand and then he rather uh, kill himself than surrender to his enemies. Xiang Yu's overbearing pride is seen as his fatal shortcoming. And who says he keeps reminding himself about this? One thing is you have to be humble because you will always, there will always be something higher above you. Step by step, literally, who starts to understand what his teacher meant by dance's inner meaning? Like one movement could be done in multiple ways, all based on each person's personality. Each movement you do, you're basically trying to put your emotions into with your movements. Who says the dance training also improved his inner world, something his parents took note of. They noticed that you become a better person, more tolerant, because after all the stretching you've gone through, you've <laughs> you know what a lot of pain could feel like. And so you start to think like small things, they're really not that painful and that it's really nothing. If you'd like to watch Michael Hu's dance and experience classical Chinese dance yourself, get your ticket for this year's competition at dance.ntdtv.com. The semifinals will take place at the Sugarloaf Performing Arts Center, New York State on September 4th, and the finals are on September 5th. You can also watch our live stream on NTD.com. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, we have a short announcement. We have our premiere at 9.30 p.m. from Monday to Saturday on TV and our YouTube channel. NTD is available on many platforms, including cable TV, satellite, and over-the-air TV across the U.S., and it continues to grow. Please check out ntd.com slash TV. Type in your zip code to find all the ways you can watch our show. That's ntd.com slash TV. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.